Hey guys, so with everything going on in the media and just all the craziness going on with this coronavirus, I wanted to discuss stockpiling and my opinions on it. And this is from the perspective of someone who is fairly well trained in the outdoors, not to uh, toot my own horn, I guess, but just kind of what I think about this and what I think should be a more general consensus about stockpiling. So first I want to talk and kind of get my opinion out there as it is. I don't really believe in stockpiling. I don't think it's a effective method of really doing anything besides postponing a much larger problem. You, to start off with, what I think people should have in their house already is simply a month's worth of dried goods. Uh, that can obviously vary depending on the size of your household, but usually not very expensive. These are like three bucks at Walmart, so make quite a bit of peanut butter. Uh, you can add that to a couple boxes of cereal, a couple boxes of pancake mix. Boom. You have dried goods that will last a couple years. So, you know, a hundred bucks every three years. I'd say it's a pretty safe investment compared to paying like $400 for a candy bar or something or whatever's going on right now. I haven't left my house. I just had surgery. So I'm kind of just going off of what I'm seeing online. But now to the more important things that I think we should be focusing on. Stockpiling is a symptom of a larger disease. It's a an, it's an lack of understanding about the world around you and how to provide for yourself without the help of someone else. And for that, the things I do think we should stockpile, books. Simple trees and shrub books. I found over a dozen edible herbaceous plants. Um, there's four different species of edible, or trees that produce edible components on our property. Maple, spruce, oak, walnut, mulberry are all of those. And a simple trees and shrubs ride that you maybe take an hour every week or so to look over and practice. You have a better understanding of what you can eat off the environment around you. Um, medicinal plants as well. When we talk about stockpiling medicine, most medicines are derived from plants originally so it doesn't hurt to have one of these around you know to understand what do you have in your immediate surroundings that you can use to provide for yourself as well as provide medicine for you or your loved ones instead of worrying about paying again an obscene amount of money or not even being able to acquire a certain medicine obviously if someone's like a diabetic or something this isn't going to help but it can help free up resources to focus on the more important things. If, for example, someone does have a medication that is necessary to survive, and you know, you can focus on acquiring that, maybe stockpiling that. And I should add that to this whole thing. Everyone's gonna be different. You know, everyone's family looks different. Um, everyone's gonna have different needs. This is not gospel by any means. This is simply my opinion and things that I think everyone can incorporate into their lifestyle. So again, a medicinal plant book. Uh, here we got just an edible wild plants book. Um, this one's really good because it includes harvesting and preparing, which can be just as important because some edible plants can have poisonous properties or are only edible when prepared a certain way. Um, just this basic little handbook, you know, teaching primitive skills, uh, friction fire, napping, simple survival tactics. This is a little bit, outside of the realm of stockpiling but it's good information to know if you for some reason had to leave your house or you got stuck in a certain area you weren't allowed to leave and while i don't think this is necessarily a huge risk and again it's just good stuff to know and botany in a day this is a good one for actually identifying plants if you understand how to identify the families of plants and how to properly identify it a nightshade or something like that as compared to something in the mustard family uh, you're gonna do yourself a lot of good if you get stuck somewhere where you don't exactly know the local plant scene you don't know the, the trees uh, just a basic idea of how to identify things there's a hundred different books that accomplish these purposes these are just ones that I like um, I have probably 300 of these books in my house so stockpiling knowledge you can get most knowledge for free these days um, at a local library or online so there's really no excuse not to know it. It doesn't take very long. Um, 
I guess now, if we want to look at a longer term scenario, because that's what most stockpiling is, an assumption that we're going to run out of certain goods, services, or food um, for a longer period of time. So like I said, you should have about a month of dry goods if you have to, and you can supplement that with whatever you have in your house and ration it, make it last, you know, a fairly long time and free up the supplies for the people that actually need it. You know, this virus, while it is dangerous, to my understanding, really only affects the elderly and the immunocompromised. So let's try to leave most of the resources for them uh, if, you, if we can, in my opinion. So I guess first on the thing is water. Uh, proper water disinfection kit. Uh, this is the Sawyer filter. Um, I have a camel back in here as well as some cleaning supplies. I'm not really going to dig that all out because it comes in the kit, but a simple water filter, something 100,000, 200,000, a million gallons, something like that in your house for your family is a really good uh, asset to have because if you don't have any water or you run out, you know, at least here in the Midwest, we have a lot of ponds, a lot of streams, stuff like that. You can go get that water. I highly recommend having a, a particulate filter as well as a chemical filter. Um, there's a lot of agricultural runoff, industrial runoff where I live. So chemical filters are really important. A place to store that water. Five gallon buckets, really simple one. Dry bags if you had to. Um, and again, you just filter that water, store it, throw it somewhere in your house. Again, this is the assumption that we you're gonna be at your house. You could go off all day on different types of scenarios where this may or may not work, but eventually you're gonna dig yourself into a rabbit hole. Uh, we're just gonna pretend like this is a, a home scenario, not an inch or a bug out scenario, which are very different things. And, um, and the, yeah, and there's that understanding, you know, you can't be prepared for everything. You just have to accept that. If you wanna be prepared for anything, you're either delusional or the quality of life you're gonna have is so low because you're gonna be living in a cement bunker underground for the rest of your life. So just an acceptance that you can't be prepared. But again, something like a simple water filter uh, for you, family members, people that you live with, whatever, it's gonna do you a lot of good. I highly recommend the Sawyer brand. That's the one I use, it's always treated me very well. Um, so yeah, so once your water's covered, water's gonna be the most important water you need every three days realistically every two but water you need every three days and also a lot of these dry goods need water to be cooked with so you're going to want to disinfect the water that you use for your dry goods especially if you have dry goods that outlast your water so yeah let's say you have your water covered now now let's talk about actual food procurement so and this is where i think a lot of people go wrong in this buying up all this food and I heard, I had one of my friends send me a picture of the outdoor section in a Walmart and a, in a Walmart and a Fred Meyer, I believe. And it was almost not touched, which to me is, again, a symptom of a larger problem. People don't understand actually how to provide for themselves. So I'm going to go over food procurement and things that you should have on hand in the case that you actually have to provide food for yourself or for your family. Um, you're going to notice I don't have a bow and arrow or gun and ammunition up here. Obviously those are things that I own and I have. However, with the panic and everything going on right now, I do not want to be one of those people encouraging others to stockpile weapons. Um, I believe that's something that should be done at your own discretion with local, state, and national laws uh, applicable to you and your situation. So I'm gonna leave that kind of in its own thing. But these are things you can generally buy anywhere. Um, again, check your local or state laws. I'm not telling you to do anything you know obviously do your own research however uh, one of the most important things in my opinion at least where I live is put these to the side for a second is fishing equipment now I simply have a one dollar zipper pouch from Walmart and in these containers I have a net and I use this you can use this for obviously a variety of things um, acquire it, catching fish, traps, as well as storing live fish. You can put fish in here, tie this off to a tree or something, leave it in the water. Uh, the fish aren't going to be able, really be able to get out of this net, um, unless obviously it's like minnows or something, but you're not going to catch minnows and put them in a net. So you can actually store live fish in this off of like a tree into a pond. So storage as well as carrying and traps. So I try to have three purposes for everything here. So. For the net, we got our three purposes. 
Um, this is a mosquito head net. Again, it has all the functions of a net, but when you're by the water's edge, especially in spring and summer months, you're generally not going to want to get eaten alive. So this is just, it's a little bit of a comfort item, but it does double as bandaging, um, again, traps, storing live fish, and you could store minnows or things like that in this because this is a lot finer of a net. Um, yeah, traps, storage, filtration, you can use this to filter out particulates from the water that you're collecting, save a little life on your filters. Uh, this is simply a buoy and about 100 feet of uh, number 36 bank line, which is a tarred, uh, you, you can get it like, there's like tarred hemp or tarred, basically it's just a tarred string. I believe this is some sort of chemical. I don't, I don't know what they make it out of, but uh, this would be a trout line. So basically I would have this go out with, and there's monofilament lines attached here that I would, can attach hooks to. So I could run across, I don't know, a hundred yard pond or so. I can float this to the other side and then I can have 15, 20, 30, however many uh, fishing lines and hooks set on this trot line with varying depths. So I'm really attacking a variety of, uh, variety of depths with a variety of fish, you know? And this is pretty strong. It's not gonna break, especially if you have a tied off to trees and stuff with the swivels on it. Uh, no issue there. So again, this is really nice to have. Um, and it's simply tucked in there if I ever need it. Monofilament line. Uh, this is the extra strength. I believe this is the 20 pound test. There's really not many fish you're going to catch out here that are bigger than 20 pounds in my area. Obviously adjust that as necessary to where you live. This is about 650 yards. This should last a very, very long time, especially in a situation where you would be reusing it most likely. So, and this does have at least three purposes. Uh, if you had to, I'm not saying to do this in any situation, but if you had to give stitches, as well as sewing, repair, um, you can make nets and other things out of it as well. But traps and fishing are what I would use it for. And I just keep a reel of it. Uh, it's obviously a little beaten up as you can see, again, in this pouch. And I keep these in pill bottles simply for the storage factor, it's easy. But I probably have about 200 sinkers. I keep lead sinkers. If you need to melt them down, you can melt them down and uh, use it for ammunition. And here I have large safety pins. I probably have 50 of those. I can either use those to make hooks if I had to, or uh, as fishing eyes to make your own poles because you're not going to want to carry a large pole with you. You can actually make the eyes, make your own pole, and uh, again, it also helps with traps, keeping your line straight. And then in this one, I have about a thousand, I would say, variety size uh, fishing hooks. Because these are going to be the hardest things to replicate in the wild. So you're going to want to have these things on hand. You know, with a thousand fishing hooks too, for one person like me, I mean, that would last me the rest of my life. I can honestly say. Um, you know, a thousand fishing hooks doesn't, this probably weighs two or three ounces and cost me five or ten bucks and it can literally feed me for the rest of my life in the right situation um, if you absolutely had to you could use these hooks to procure other animals um, obviously that's probably illegal anywhere you go and very frowned upon but in a situation where you absolutely had to I, you know you could catch squirrels or mice and stuff with hooks uh, I don't recommend that obviously that's if you're you know starving to death somewhere but so fishing you know pretty easy. Toss it over here first. And then just a simple classic a slingshot. You know, with a slingshot, you can kill most things, you know, rabbits, possums, squirrels, anything like that. You can even fit you can even fish with a slingshot if you're good enough. Uh, literally unlimited ammunition off the ground, uh, rocks, pebbles, things like that. You can carry steel ball bearings if you want uh, I don't really do that I just don't think it's necessary you can melt down some of the lead shot that we have in the uh, fishing sinkers and use it for ammunition if you absolutely had to um, I have a spare band for this as well uh, I usually carry a couple spare bands if I want to make more slingshots or simply if this one just breaks you don't this is going to be one of your key items that's going to last you the longest as well as probably be one of your main hunting sources outside of 
archery or um, rifle, shotguns, whatever you're carrying in that regard. And then traps. So this is a 220 Hanna Bear. This is an instant kill trap. Kills pretty much anything up to the size of a bobcat. So, but obviously if for food purposes, rabbits, squirrels, fish, muskrats, beavers, things like that. For a beaver, you probably want something like a 330, but um, these are worth their weight in gold. You don't expend calories using them. They're always working for you. You can use them on just about anything. Uh, I usually carry three different types. The 110, uh, which is your smaller trap. You're gonna kill bass if you use it on fish, but muskrats, squirrels, stuff like that uh, would be a 110 prime example. A little bit larger again, coons, possums, larger rabbits, larger fish. 220, it would be a 330. You can just about kill anything in North America with this if you absolutely had to. Uh, again, these are very dangerous. So if you don't, I've worked animal nuisance for a long time. So I understand how to use these. If you do not understand how to use these, seek professional to teach you. Um, abide by all your local and state trapping laws, things like that. Uh, these are very dangerous. So you can break your arm, break your leg, uh, kill you, uh, you know, if you're in the wrong situation, I guess. So be very careful with these, but I believe these are a necessity for a long-term survival situation. Um, a safer version of these would be the leg hold. Um, the, this would be for more of a muskrat or squirrel, things like that. And you can set these on the water and do just about anything you need with them. And they don't hurt. I can, no, actually I'll do that right now. I haven't done one of those in a while. These aren't going to break your fingers or anything. So don't feel too bad about it. No, things don't chew their legs off in these if you set them properly, obviously. Again, you need to understand what you're doing and have anchors and wire and things like that prepared for these. But that is really gonna be a key source of food if you absolutely needed it to. So when it comes to, I guess, to bring it all together, you know, I forgot one thing actually. Uh, medication, so we're gonna look at the things that I do have one full bottle generically of are ibuprofen, acetaminophen. This should be acetaminophen. Oh, I'm sorry, this is naproxen sodium, which is, again, a painkiller, pain reliever. This is, you know, I don't really know how to pronounce this, cymethicone, but it's a gas reliever. Uh, gas can be extremely painful. If your intestines get stopped up and especially if you're on a new diet and you're stressed out you're not going to want that uh, this is just some more ibuprofen uh, I had an extra in the bag and then Benadryl Benadryl aller dangerous allergic reactions uh, if you had to it would help you go to sleep calm me down but those are things I tend to have a little bit extra of no matter what um, you know they last for quite a long time the generic bottles only cost me a few dollars and you could probably trade them if you absolutely had to, had to for quite a bit, but they're just nice things to have. Uh, you don't necessarily have, need them, but again, if you do have some sort of condition where you have to have a medication, it would probably be good to carry some of that with you as well as some other simple medications, you know, so you're not paying an obscene amount or going without, uh, and especially in a very high stress scenario, you're going to want to if you have a headache, you're just going to want to take a, a Tylenol or something. You're not going to want to have to go forage around and look for uh, yarrow or something like that. Um, and then mason jars, last but not least. You and I have a few of these around. Uh, storing food, storing it dry, whether it's dried herbs or if you're making like jams, jellies, things. Like for example, with the mulberry tree behind me, I could probably fill 20 of these with mulberry jelly last just however long you needed to um, you can hold water in them things like that there's so many purposes that it's almost hard for me to get in but these simple glass containers uh, they don't have the lids on them right now those are in another box but having 10 or 20 of those 
in your basement, you know, forget about them if you don't use them. But understanding, maybe learning how to can, buying a book on it, you're not going to necessarily be worried about it if you just have that skill and you know it. So again, to accumulate all of this, this isn't a large amount of stuff, and obviously you'd probably have more. But at the end of the day, you could fit, I I can fit everything I need to live indefinitely in five five gallon buckets or a backpack and maybe another one if I absolutely had to. And that is simply because I've stockpiled on knowledge and that's gonna be the most important thing. If you understand where you are, what's around you and understand the basics of how to survive certain situations, everything else becomes a luxury. So to accumulate all of it, I do not believe stockpiling is at least the way we do it in America or in the States, I guess. I'm sure other countries have people doing it this way too. I don't believe it is necessary. I believe it's a symptom of just a lack of information. I think having preparations in place is very important, but I don't think going to Costco and buying a bunch of frozen food and toilet paper that is going to do you any good because one, if you're that worried about, you know, if you're that worried about the state of your union, electricity should be considered a luxury, you know. If the power goes out, all your food goes bad. So you're going to want to have ways to A, keep food safe and edible, so dry goods. Also procure more food, fishing, hunting, trapping. And again, uh, I didn't get into it today, but firearms, archery, very important. Uh, to store that food, again, you have your mason jars. You have your water so you can actually survive to see, need to get hungry, you know. Have a simple water kit. Again, most of this is for myself, so I have small preparations basic medicinal supplies and again books you know and if you got free time like I do I'm on house quarantine I can't leave I don't have anything to do all day but read so I can learn more hopefully trim down my preparations to things that are even more essential and less less things that I own because I don't have the knowledge and that is what I think is going to be key here so I hope you guys took something out of this today help dispel a little bit of fear around the stockpiling and that you need everything and start looking into how do I procure my own food? How do I make my own medicine? How do I store my own food? How do I disinfect my own water? Because at that point, everything else is going to become a luxury. So I appreciate you staying tuned, especially watching to the end like this. Uh, feel free to subscribe as I heal from my, uh, I just had a surgery. So as I heal, I'm going to be producing more videos out in the field. But for now, I did want to do a discussion and continue with some other discussion series where I go more into depth on things like trapping and food procurement and storage and hunting and fishing and things like that. So thank you and I hope you have a great day.